All right. Picture this, it's mid-pandemic, retail stores, restaurants, hairdressers and the like are closed all across the world. People are locked down, out of the job or working from home. There's literally nothing to do and nowhere to go. So how on God's green earth do the biggest luxury fashion companies, the brands selling what you think you'd need the least of all at that moment in time, how did 13 of them end up reporting double-digit net profit margins in 2020? Who was buying things like these? Well, actually they were released a little bit later, but for the sake of argument, run with it. These destroyed sneakers for $1,850 a pair. In this episode of Trading You Explores, we're deep diving into the who's who of public companies delivering haute couture to the world. It's not financial advice, it's just stylish commentary. And along the way, we'll explore some of the key themes and drivers powering this mega $100 billion plus industry. LVMH. Louis Vuitton, they make suitcases, Moet, they make champagne, Hennessy, they make cognac. A simple three-pronged business, right? Of course not. LVMH is a juggernaut, a vast conglomerate of the world's most recognizable brands, spearheaded by a ruthless septuagenarian business magnate called Bernard Arnault, with a market cap of around 300 billion US dollars at the time of this recording, they're officially Europe's most valuable business. They're even crossing the pond and buying up American darlings like Tiffany's, for goodness sake. In fact, if you were to add every initial of all the businesses they own across the six different sectors they operate in, add those onto their name, it would be LVMH C D L C D Y D. Yes, when it comes to public fashion companies, you seem to have two main options. A tightly controlled family-run European mid-cap operation, or a tightly controlled, still often family-run European mega conglomerate where multiple world-class brands hang out under one corporate entity. Perhaps the latter arise because of family infighting out of the Gucci Wars of the 1970s and 80s, or maybe because creative folk don't always make the best business management decisions, or maybe the inherently ephemeral nature of fashion and the chances of badly missing the mark with a few collections and all that lends itself better to having a stable house of other fashion brands to diversify away some of that risk. For LVMH, it's probably a bit of all of the above, not to mention the inherent advantages of having someone like Mr. Onno as its captain in chief, a man who has absolutely no qualms about acquiring a business, laying off 9,000 of its workers in a couple of years after, and then selling off the bits of the operation he no longer needs while keeping the profitable rest. But it works! LVMH's stock trading under the ticker MC on the Euronext has been on an upward trajectory for ages, up 140% in the past five years. It might not be Tesla level growth, but look at this income statement for 2021. Revenue is up 44% to 64 billion euros. Gross profit is up by 52% to come in at nearly 44 billion euros. And the basic earnings per share is up 156% to nearly 24 euros a share. In fact, the only pressing question right now is what will happen to the business when Mr. Arnaud, the Terminator, retires? It's the late 1950s. Christabel Balenciaga is in his studio on Avenue George V, Paris, with an espresso on the table, cigarette in one hand and a pen in the other. And out of his mind and onto the pad flows shape after exquisite shape the world had never seen before. The baby doll dress, sack dress and cocoon coat, for example. His work goes on to become some of the most iconic designs in fashion. But what became of those sketches? The paper chrysalis from which so much in beauty in the world unfolded? NFTs. 8,000 of his drawings are now NFTs. Yes, digital goods are definitely a part of the strategy of Curing, the second biggest conglomerate behind LVMH and the proud corporate owner of major fashion houses such as Balenciaga, Gucci, Yves Saint Laurent, Bottega Veneta and Alexander McQueen. Balenciaga announced the formation of an in-house metaverse unit in December last year. Gucci currently accepts payment in a host of cryptos including Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum, Litecoin, Dogecoin and even Shibu Inu. There were rumours Yves Saint Laurent was thinking about creating its own cryptocurrency at one point, which seems like a spectacularly bad idea right now. Alexander McQueen launched a new technology-driven label called MCQ, backed by blockchain technology to enable both designers and consumers to securely register and trade clothing. Yes, it's clear there's money to be made in this brave new decentralised world, and Morgan Stanley agrees, forecasting that the metaverse will present more than 50 billion dollar opportunity for luxury fashion industry over the next decade, with a 22.6 billion dollar market for luxury NFTs included in that figure. Fashion, of course, is always about renewal, experimentation and growth and pushing limits. 
Meanwhile, crypto has created an entirely new class of wealthy spender looking for stuff to buy. That being said, the taste of some of these whales, at least going by their Twitter flexes, is uh, somewhat questionable. And of course, many crypto holders are now far poorer in 2022 than they were in 2021. These fashion houses will probably be tweaking some of their rollout plans to account for that, but I've not seen any indication that fashion houses are pulling away from the space, regardless of the bear market vibes out there right now. Speaking of markets, Korean stock trading under the ticker CER is up 60% over the past five years. It's had a particularly good pandemic. Total revenue for 2021 increased 35% to 17.65 billion euros. Gross profit was up nearly 43% to 10.62 billion euros. And basic earnings per share was up nearly 50% to 25.49 euros. Hard to keep track of what the company will do next given all the brands under its wheelhouse, but we'll show Web3 efforts will play a growing part of its plans for the years to come. These are some boots made by fashion label Dunhill, part of the Swiss conglomerate Richmond, the third largest luxury goods company in the world, founded in 1988 by South African businessman Johann Rupert. They cost $995, all right? It's kind of a lot, but I can see somebody paying for it. But what if instead of costing $995, they actually cost $1,250? Would our affluent consumer really be like, right, that's for dick, I'm not paying that? Probably not. And this is the unusual thing about luxury goods. Usually, the laws of supply and demand say that if you increase something's cost while maintaining the same level of supply, you reduce demand. Like, why would I pay for a Pepsi Max if it was twice the price of a Coke Zero, but, and I'm gonna say something provocative here, it tastes pretty much the same. I love you. The answer lies in something that's called the Veblen effect. And it's what allows people like Richmond to increase prices to do stuff like bump up gross profits or keep afloat with inflation without harming demand. And it's not just Richmond, by the way, they're all at it. For example, this Chanel classic flat bag that my wife would absolutely love for her birthday but is not going to get, now costs $9,500, something like 40% more than it did just two years ago. McKinsey is also expecting to see an average of a 3.2% retail price hike within the fashion industry this year. The phenomenon, named after American economist and sociologist Thornstein Veblen, examines why, for certain goods, increases in price actually also increase demand as well. And it postulates two main reasons for this discrepancy. Number one, perception of quality. If it costs a lot, it must be well made, right? Those boots aren't going to fall apart on me anytime soon, so long as I can afford it, I'm gonna pay extra to get rid of the hassle of not having to buy another pair. Discworld novelist Terry Pratchett describes this process another way as the boots theory of socioeconomic unfairness, which is well worth reading up on. And point two, the high price itself acts as a form of utility for the user. Because it's so expensive, only a slim majority of the general population can buy these boots and therefore the wearer must be in that special elite and everyone else who knows their stuff, i.e. other elites, will be aware of that. Sometimes there's no underlying utility at all, you know, like being able to protect your feet from the puddles, apart from its exclusivity. Think certain highly priced pictures of bored looking apes, for example. Generally, all of these items are called positional goods because the object positions the consumer in relation to those around them. If you've got the right brand and the right sales strategy, usually with a century-long pedigree to back it all up, then your luxury goods company can charge almost what it wants, making it a very defensible proposition in today's era where inflation would eat into profits otherwise, so long as the rich don't go bankrupt. Which doesn't seem to be the case right now. Richmond as a whole, owner of brands like Dunhill and Cartier, Vacheron Constantine, Piaget, they've all been doing great. Sales were up 46% for the year ended 31st of March 2022, and gross profit for the year rose by 53% to 12 billion euros. That being said though, their stock, trading under the ticker CFR, has had its ups and downs for sure, only up 21% in the past five years. Mario Prada and his brother Martino originally launched the company Prada in 1913, selling leather goods, trunks and handbags at two boutiques in Milan. In fact, the quality was so good, in 1919, Prada was appointed as the official supplier to the Italian royal house. Today, it remains thoroughly Italian, with Mario's granddaughter as the co-CEO and the company's headquarters in Milan. So why are the company's shares listed 5,800 miles away under the numerical ticker 1913 on the Hong Kong exchange? Well, to understand this is to understand one of the key drivers of both revenue and profit for many luxury fashion houses, not just Prada. 
Asia's appetite for luxury goods is huge, enormous, gargantuan, as pronounced as Patrick Bateman's penchant for a bone white business card. Picked them up from the printers yesterday. Right now, according to Statistica, revenue in Asia's luxury fashion segment will amount to $133 billion for this year. Indeed, consulting firm Bain estimates that Asia's luxury market share, defined as China, Japan, and then the rest of Asia combined, will amount to 54% of the entire global market by 2025. The firm expects China itself to account up to 28% of global luxury consumption by 2025, up from just 11% in 2019. Meanwhile, Europe and the Americas will decline from around 30% market share to somewhere between 22 and 24%. Such heavy interest in the Asian consumer, particularly the Chinese consumer, brings with it a desire to not fall on the wrong side of the Chinese state. Indeed, we've seen this recently in changes to Prada's marketing strategy, which is apparently moving away from celebrity-driven marketing in the face of a widely reported crackdown within China on celebrity culture. Prada instead focusing on art exhibitions, exclusive pop-ups, traditional brand-focused ad campaigns and athlete spokespeople and the like. Looking long-term, there's the growing economic and military flexes, plus all that bellicose language between the East and West. Top US intelligence officer John Ratcliffe claiming China is the greatest threat to democracy and freedom since World War II, for example. It all looks set to cause no small amount of headache for brands trying to straddle both sides of the ever-widening geopolitical divide. Returning to Prada's financials, its shares peaked two years after its 2011 IPO, bottoming out from 2014 until right up until COVID hit. Today, it's finally back to around its IPO price after years of sliding fundamentals. Total revenue was up 44% to $3.94 billion USD, gross profit was up 81% to nearly $2.29 billion, and earnings per share jumped 665% to 14 US cents. Harking back to crypto for a second, the brand has also been getting into Web3 space, launching Prada Crypted and recently dropping a limited run of 100 NFTs, although they were basically kind of just digital receipts from some t-shirts that they were selling. Given China's less than enthusiastic stance on crypto as of late, this might also be another divergence of its strategy in Western markets and Eastern ones. In the days of Charles Frederick Worth, the father of haute couture all the way back in the 1850s, luxury fashion meant customers going to an atelier and getting measured up for a bespoke item custom made to their specific measurements. Nowadays, of course, there's much more emphasis on ready to wear clothing because of its much greater sales volume. And the industry as a whole has together evolved since the 1800s into a tried and tested seasonal format. Houses largely debut their latest collections at a spring and fall fashion week, brought to life by a sole creative director. Think Carl Lagerfeld at Chanel, Tom Ford at Gucci, Valentino at Valentino, Alexander McQueen at Alexander McQueen. You get the idea. Then, at Milan Fashion Week in 2018, luxury winter wear brand Moncleur launched something a little bit different. Dubbed the Genius Project, the company decided to take the idea of appointing a single creative director to oversee seasonal collections pinned to fashion weeks and throw it in the bin. Instead, Moncler's approach, which was pretty novel at the time of its inception, advocated the use of multiple creative directors to work for the same brand, creating their own individual collections to be released on a rolling basis instead. Combining elements of both fashion collabs and drop culture, Moncler can then market new items on a monthly basis to try to capture the attention deficit gaze of our phone adult population. And it does seem to be working. The project now accounts for between 5 and 10% of Moncler's revenue, and CEO Remo Ruffini, who purchased the once nearly bankrupt business back in 2003, said the Genius Project has become the true creativity hub, allowing for a more regular conversation with customers. Moncler's wider strategy seems to be paying off too. The business, named as an abbreviation of an alpine town near Grenoble, France, has had a pretty steady ride of things since its listing on the Milan Stock Exchange in 2013, up 135% in that time. 2021's figures put revenues up 42% to around 2 billion euros, gross profit up 50% to 1.37 billion euros, and at the bottom end, earnings per share of 1 euro and 48 cents, representing a rise of nearly 25%. Not too sure what's next for Moncler here, but I hope their business strategy remains as distinctive as this cyberpunky mountaineering flask and perfume bottle that they've just released. You see this wallet here? It's from Burberry. A couple of years ago, do you know what they would have done with it if it hadn't sold? Bam, burnt, 
gone. Yes, the British fashion label got publicly called out in the press for destroying unsold clothes, accessories and perfume worth £28.6 million to protect its brand in 2017. Although it did say energy generated from burning its products was captured, making the whole process environmentally friendly. Captured by who exactly? Kamati the Boilerman? Regardless, the figure took the total value of goods it had destroyed over the five preceding years to more than £90 million. Yes, the fashion industry as a whole has long been pilloried for not being the most environmentally friendly of peeps, with complex supply chains, transporting raw materials many thousands of miles, lots of processing involved to turn them into finished products, opaque insight into working conditions in developing countries, and of course the idea that some garments are worn once or twice before going out of fashion and trashed. And let's not forget that sometimes the damage from the garment industry is so bad, it can literally be seen from space. So it's no wonder that reminded of this bad news on an almost constant basis, Western consumers have become more engaged with sustainability than ever before. At least that's according to a 2020 survey by McKinsey and Company. They polled more than 2,000 people in Germany and the United Kingdom and found that two thirds of them were making it a priority to limit their impact on climate change when it comes to luxury goods. As a result, when we talk about high fashion, sustainability seems to be the top of everyone's mind. And it certainly is now at Burberry, as they've done something of an about turn since 2018, racing to scale up regenerative agricultural practices within their supply chains to help slow or reverse the destructive impacts that industrial agriculture has on the climate and global water and soil supplies. They've also increased the scope of their repair services and are committing to no longer use exotic leathers in their future collections. The house will be hoping that all of this helps change their stock run. Their share price is pretty much the same as it was five years ago, although it did post decent 2021 financials. Total revenue for that year was up 20%, with gross profit up 23% to hit £1.68 billion, although earnings per share grew just 5, well, 6% to come in at just under £1. We start this session at the Battle of Versailles. No, not that one, this one. It's 1973, the gilded, sprawling former royal residence to the French monarchy that is the Palace of Versailles had fallen into disrepair and was in urgent need of restoration. Cue the amazing idea to pit five French and five American designers against each other in some sort of red v blue team battle just with models and outfits instead of battle rifles and sticky grenades. Honestly, nobody thought the Americans had a chance. Americans don't create anything original, fashion-wise at least, they just copy French designs. That was the genuine sentiment at the time. Needless to say, USA rules, Liza Minnelli brings the house down, the designs are exquisite, and the American designers are declared overwhelming victors on the night. The whole thing is covered on the Netflix show Halston, which is actually a surprisingly good watch. Now, Ralph Lauren might not have been at that show, he was doing all sorts of stuff that year, like opening his first store out in California, but what we can see at work here is a consumer quirk consciousness that just as much affects his business as it does the five other US fashion designers that were there. It's called brand origin bias. Essentially, this is a well-documented mental shortcut whereby consumers, including you, readily associate the quality of a product or service that a business provides with a preconceived idea of the quality you'd expect from a business from that specific country. So if something's made in Italy, it must be opulent and luxurious. If it's made in France, it must be elegant and classy. Britain, sophisticated yet quirky. A less economically developed part of the world than unfortunately poorly made and cheap. And if it's American fashion, the preconceived mental projection, at least in the West, is often one of preppy sportiness, of Nike sweats, Calvin Klein jeans, Steve Madden trainers, Michael Kors bags, bags and the like. And this is where Ralph Lauren gets positioned too. It's not necessarily a bad thing though, and I'm not going so far as to call Ralph Lauren at leisure. However, for the sake of underscoring that point, a report from a few years ago did predict that the athleisure industry would actually be worth $257 billion by 2026. So there is certainly money to be made here. But the point I'm actually making is, when you're charging $26,500 for a duffel bag, affluent consumers may evaluate your brand in comparison to top-end European rivals and draw conclusions based solely on the fact that you're a new world, not old world business. And that might work against you in the top echelons of luxury fashion. On the other hand though, the United States of America has the strongest economy on the planet, and it seems like this domestic market alone could bring with it significant upside to counteract the brand origin effect. So maybe that's what we're seeing with Ralph's stock, which, trading under the ticker RL, 
is up nearly 30% in the past five years. 2021 revenues totaled $6.22 billion and gross profits are up 50% for the year to hit $3.93 billion. Meanwhile, earnings per share have bounced back from a disastrous 2020, increasing nearly 600% to $8.22. That made USA label ain't doing too bad after all, seems. The little black dress worn by Liz Hurley at the premiere of Four Weddings and a Funeral was loaned to her by Versace's flagship store in Old Bond Street, London, as a big favour for the, at the time, largely unknown actress. Made from silk and lycra, it was wide open at the front, and each side had a cutaway part held together by six oversized gold safety pins. The world's jaws dropped when she attended that premiere, launching Hurley's career and making Versace a household name too operating under the organizational structure Capri Holdings, which has in its roster mega brands like Michael Kors, Versace has long used star power to drive business results. Today, Dua Lipa is one of the brand's latest ambassadors, following in the footsteps of everyone from Madonna to Lady Gaga, from JLo to Bella Hadid. And from a brand theory perspective, this strategy makes sense. Celebrities have long been used as a shortcut in people's brains to transfer a set of preconceptions and notions from the celebrity onto the brand. According to Pipslay, 59% of Americans say celebrity endorsements influence their behavior. And this is particularly important when we come to luxury houses and the Veblen effect that we went over earlier in this video. Because if you're going to justify two months rent for a dress, then you need to demonstrate it's from a brand worn by people you look up to in society, or at least people you look at. That being said though, recent surveys have called into question the effectiveness of this tactic. According to the University of Hull in England, celebrity endorsements may only influence 4% of fashion shoppers in 2022. 4%! And according to Kantar, today celebrities only feature in around 16% of all the ads worldwide, indicating the demand for such endorsements isn't as significant as it once was, perhaps. The partnerships can also backfire on you big time, like they did Versace when the Chinese actress Yang Mi said she'd end her cooperation with the brand after a controversy erupted over one of their t-shirts that seemed to say that Hong Kong and Macau were separate countries to China. Moving on to Capri's financials, the business's stock is up around 25% in the last five years, total revenue is up 40% for 2021 at $5.65 billion, gross profit is sitting around $3.55 billion, up around 50%, and earnings per share jumped massively after it had a pretty disastrous 2020, up 1,432% to $5.39 a share. And for our last theme of the day, we're not looking at one, but we're looking at Two companies, Brunella Cuccinelli trading under the ticker BC on the Milan Stock Exchange, and Xenia, a recent fashion house SPAC, a special purpose acquisition company trading on the New York Stock Exchange as ZGN. What do both these companies have in common? Well, apart from being Italian, they're owned and run by the families that founded them. Brunella Cuccinelli's family's trust owns 51% of the company's stock, while at Xenia, Emengildo Xenia, grandson of founder Emengildo, is chairman in addition to CEO, while his cousin Paolo Xenia is on the board of directors. They are also both heavily involved in corporate social responsibility and social good. BC's Family Trust selling a 1 million euro stake in their business to fund its charitable foundation. The proceeds going towards Mr. Cuccinelli's lifelong restoration projects within his local community. Xenia, meanwhile, has a history of environmentalism dating back to the 1930s and recently made the decision to link executive pay to climate targets. Yes, unlike private equity businesses, which are often concerned with the deep restructuring, profit maximization, and quick sale of the companies they own, family-run organizations have the luxury of more time. They also have the ability to prioritize other metrics in measuring stakeholder value rather than just price. For example, ensuring the longevity and the stability of the business over the 40 years Brunella Cuccinelli has been operating. For some, this is a welcome change to the high risk, high reward, definitely high risk, might implode culture of other popular wings of both the private and public markets over the past few years. <coughs> work. On the flip side though, effective control by a family can hinder as well as help, especially if the next generation of management is incompetent or divided, as there's no effective mechanism for holding them accountable and turning the ship around. The majority vote always goes to the family. 
If you'd like to see this dynamic play out in highly entertaining form, watch the struggles of the Gucci family in House of Gucci. Actually, better yet, read the book. The film is a little bit of a mess, lots of exposition, but no real emotional connection or individual narrative arc. Wrapping this up with the fundamentals, BC is up 75% over the past five years, while Xenia, which is less than a year on the public markets, is down 15%. Good taste is like manners. Just like it's no good being polite on a Monday and then an absolute a-hole on a Wednesday, so too must one be stylish every day of the week or not be stylish at all. At least that's what you gotta do if you wanna position yourself as a trendy, fashion-conscious person these days. And let's face it, a lot of people do want this. The drive for luxury has been around as long as humanity itself. Plato was speaking over 2,000 years ago about the luxurious city which has surrendered itself to the endless acquisition of money and having overstepped the limits of its necessities. This drive is certainly not slowing down in today's times. Last year, the value of the fashion industry rose 40% year on year, outperforming the wider stock market for the sixth year in a row. With average annual growth of around 7%, consulting firm Bain predicts the luxury market as a whole will be worth around $420 billion by 2025. But as we've examined, there's a load of factors at play here when it comes to the lasting success of fashion houses on the public markets, selling what is, at its essence, an ephemeral product. A brief snapshot of global society's expressed idea of taste at a given moment in time. These snapshots are made through lots of hard work and creativity, and they are charged a very high price for. So if you miss the mark, the consequences can be steep and they can be costly. Hence, it seems investing successfully in this category may follow that exact same formula, where the devil is all in the finest of details. Good luck, and remember, whatever you're wearing, look first, then leap.